Okay. Uh, please get transfers in. Um, a couple more seconds, so please get transfers in. All right, so we're gonna close the poll. And you now do you wanna announce the results? Um, yep, so we have 43% saying A and 57% saying C. So 43% uh, said A and uh, how much? And 57% said C. Okay. So most people chose C with some going in. Well, correct answer is A, and uh, I'm glad that ha at least half of you were able to get it right. Um, most of you were able to um, kind of get to that point. All right, so let's go over it. Why is it A and why is it not C? Well, so um, A is articulate and defend a contractarian view of justice, okay. Whereas C is compare the utilitarian and contractarian theories of justice. Well, let, let's go back to passage and let's see. Well, um, like I mentioned, the main idea is something that the author will always try and weave back into um, the passage. So he'll constantly be mentioning it. Everything will basically tie back into it, right? Well, he mentions um, utilitarianism here in the first paragraph where he says two important concepts are this and um, notion of social contract, right? So he introduces two different um, ideas, two different philosophies, right? Um, however, if you notice, really, he doesn't talk about utilitarianism again for pretty much most of the passage, right? This has nothing really about utilitarianism, neither does this, neither does this. And then I believe uh, he mentions it again somewhere here, but very, very briefly. And again, nothing really about it. So four of the five paragraphs don't really have anything regarding utilitarianism. They almost all exclusively focus only on contractarianism, right? So that kind of rules out utilitarianism as part of the main idea, as one of the subjects, right? So the subject could be one idea or it could be two ideas that he could be comparing and contrasting. I wouldn't really say he's comparing and contrasting two different ideas because he doesn't really talk about both of them that much. He only talks about one of them. The other, he just mentions that it exists, but he doesn't talk about many of its tenants or how it compares to contractarianism or how it differs or maybe how one may be better than the other or something like that, right? Mostly he just talks about one. So that's why I think, um, that's why I think C can't be the right answer. Whereas A, articulate and defend a, tr a contractarian view of justice. Well, we can see, like I mentioned, mo almost the entire passage is solely about contractarianism and just explaining it, go, the different processes and different evolutions it went through throughout history with John Rawl. And also, but we want to get to the main point, what is his purpose? He's trying to praise it, he's trying to defend it. And remember, that was one of my main ideas that I said is very common, praising or um, kind of telling the benefits or defending um, a certain idea. Well, how do you know that he's defending it rather than just describing it? Well, um, he, in this last paragraph, um, so before he's talking about just describing it, well, here he says, while it can be and has been argued that the blind choosers envisioned by the new contractarians might well decide to gamble on the outcome, such arguments are ultimately lacking in interest, right? So what does he do here? He describes contractarianism, then he describes a counter argument that many uh, would say could oppose contractarianism and go against it. But instead of just leaving at it as that, he then himself refutes that uh, kind of criticism, contractarianism by saying, such arguments are ultimately lacking in interest. So arguing against contractarianism, specifically this argument is uh, ultimately lacking, right? Um, so he, 
that's how you know that he's defending something, right? Because if you're just describing something, you would maybe give its pros and then a couple of cons or maybe any criticisms or anything like that if you're just um, kind of a neutral observer. Whereas if you were defending it or praising it, you would try and shoot down any criticisms and only um, speak about its uh, virtues, right? And that's what he's doing here. So the way I would read this uh, passage um, to get that. So as I would read through this first paragraph, I would maybe think that, okay, he is comparing utilitarianism and contractarianism. That would be my first thought upon reading, reaching the end of this first paragraph. Once I read the second paragraph, I kind of shy away from that because I believe that he hasn't talked about utilitarianism in this paragraph. So I would kind of shy away from that. And I would say he's describing contractarianism. Again, these two paragraphs would kind of confirm in my mind, and this is just as I'm reading it, um, would kind of confirm in my mind that he's not talking about utilitarianism, so it can be a compare and contrast. It has to be a description, right? Then finally, once I get to this last paragraph, I would see that he makes this um, common criticism and then tries to refute it, and that would kind of give me the hint that he's not only um, describing um, utilitarian, uh, contractarianism, but he's also defending it and praising it, and he considers it very uh, correct. Okay. okay. And that's how we get A. So it articulates, which describes and defends or, or praises a contractarian view, right? Um, and uh, nobody picked this, but just to go over it, um, B. Uh, propose a radical solution. He's not really proposing a solution. He's, and he even says in the last paragraph, contractarianism is not practical because it can't practically be done. It's only theoretical and it's uh, more of a theoretical basis of philosophy. And D, examine advantages and disadvantages of Rawls theory. He, Rawls theory is a part of his um, passage, but it's a small part Mostly, he's talking about um, contractarianism as a whole, and Rawls theory is only a small part of it. And he doesn't really um, talk necessarily about the disadvantages of Rawls theory, um, only the advantages. So, in that sense, um, it's not, it wouldn't be D because it's not advantages and disadvantages. And also, D is more of a sub point rather than a main idea. Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have any questions about this or anything you want me to explain further? Anything you not sure about? Yes, Mark. Uh, you said uh, the. How do you distinguish between a description? You said in the last three paragraph that mm -hmm. wasn't really talking, so he's not comparing our contrast. So you automatically know it was going to be a description. So how do we? Right. So mm -hmm. in these three paragraphs. So like I mentioned, I, I was kind of giving you my main idea, like I mentioned, uh, should be changing as you're reading the passage. So you should be in your mind forming what the main idea is as you're reading it, not something you read fully and then you kind of say, oh, this is probably it. It should be changing as you're reading it and as you receive information. Once I read these paragraphs, I think it's just a description because so far he's just describing. He's not necessarily, um, he's not necessarily kind of defending it. However, in this last paragraph, he is defending it, right? And once you get to that point, he's now praising it. In the end, his conclusion, he was trying to praise it. And that kind of um, changes like the whole, uh, that kind of changes the whole pass passage, right? Because now he was describing what it is. And now he's also saying, this is like the correct way. There's no downside to this. This is kind of uh, the best way. And he does this by um, saying a common criticism of contractarianism and then refuting it. And if you guys have ever in high school or college written um, argumentative essays, have you ever, if you've ever been um, told to write argumentative essays for an English class, um, they will often ask you to do this to support your argument. They'll ask you to make a counterclaim and then refute that counterclaim. And that's how you know it's an argumentative essay rather than just a descriptive essay. That's exactly what he's doing here. He has a paragraph in his um, argumentative essay where he introduced a counterclaim and then refutes it. All right. Thank you.
Is that um, make it clear? Yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so we don't necessarily need to know um, the the difference between the verbs articulate, propose, compare, examine. I mean, so um, yes, I, I would say you should. So articulate. Articulate, what, what are synonyms of articulate? Well, describe or kind of articulate, put into words, describe. It, it's that kind of action, right? It's not like a, it's not really like a defending action. It's just like a neutral action, I guess, if you want to put it like articulate is just describing, right? That's one part of it. And that was the first three, paragra uh, three paragraphs. And then defend is a um, praising kind of action. You want to, by defending something, you're kind of supporting it, you're praising it, you're kind of trying to show its merit, right? That's what it means to defend. Whereas propose, he's not really proposing a solution, so that wouldn't really be the right verb because he's not saying this is a practical solution. He's not proposing a new solution to, say, a body of government or a country or something like that. He is instead just, just describing and defending it, right, in a theoretical sense. Comparing is very obvious. He's, it involves two things. Um, and like I mentioned, I don't think he is involving two things as main idea. Um, D, examine. Examine could be a, a, the right verb, but again, examine advantage and disadvantage is not kind of the right uh, thing here, but yeah. So do pay attention to verbs. Verbs can be sometimes important. Okay, thank you. Right. Any other questions from anybody else? If not, I will move on. Okay. So, um, so now we kind of have an idea of how to get the main idea. And I don't expect you guys to be able to perfectly guess it every time after just hearing one lecture or me speak about it for 10 minutes. Um, this is some, unlike in physics, chemistry, biology, this is not something you can memorize. It's something that you have to learn how to do like as, like any skill, right? So the best way I would suggest doing this is practice. Go on exam crackers, go on Kaplan, go on any site that offers uh, passages, especially cars passages, and try and put this into action. Try and guess the main idea and see, is that something that you can accurately do every time? And what are different techniques you can try? Maybe, like I mentioned with mine, I go through it. Uh, kind of paragraph by paragraph. And as I'm reading, I try and formulate a main idea. And then I would change it as I get new information as I'm reading, right? That could be one way, maybe try other ways if then way doesn't work for you. And um, maybe try at the end, maybe try reading the questions first. And based on the questions, uh, try and get like an idea of where this passage is about, right? So, but the main thing I want to like address is like there are common themes in addressing main idea. There are very common uh, main ideas or purposes. And you should have an idea of what you're looking for as you're reading it, okay? Um, but once you know the purpose and the main idea of the writing, the MCAT also expects you to be able to get into the minds and predict the thoughts of the author, okay? Based on how they feel on one topic, there sometimes you can predict how they would feel about another. So I give you a simple example here. So say there's this author, Bob. He writes a paper in which you determine the main idea is to inc uh, criticize increased funding for stem cell research based on perceived ethical concerns. You believe that th the reason he's writing this paper is because he doesn't like stem cell research and he doesn't like it um, for ethical um, concerns, right? You could then infer that Bob would criticize any new technology that results from stem cell research and would praise any similar technology that uses other research methods. If he doesn't like stem cell research for ethical concerns, if for example, there was a new drug or a new um, like therapy or something like new product that was released that was entirely based on stem cell research, he would also not like that product, right? And that's what I mean by inferences you know that he doesn't like stem cell research. So you would then be able to maybe infer that he would, doesn't like a new product because it was based on stem cell research, right? And similarly, you would maybe, he would maybe praise any similar technology that uses 
other research methods, right? Because he doesn't like stem cell research, he would like the alternatives, right? And that's something you can infer. So an important note, in addition to the uh, purpose, you must also look at their reasoning, why they have the opinion that they have. So for example, another author, John, writes a similar paper in which you determine the main idea is, is to also criticize increased funding for stem cell research. But instead of ethical concerns, he criticizes it because he believes uh, stem cell research is a dead end and will not yield any useful results. He doesn't care about any pos possible ethical concern concerns. If uh, he was to be shown a new technology based on stem cells that was proven to be effective, John would likely not be opposed to it, but Bob, the previous author, likely would still be opposed, right? And why is that? Well, it's because of their reasoning. Bob didn't like stem cell research because of ethical concerns. If you show him a new technology that's made on stem cell research, he still would not like the new technology because he believes it's unethical. However, John doesn't like stem cell research solely because he believes it's ineffective and inefficient, it's a dead end, right? And he believes the money could be better spent somewhere else. However, if you show him a product that's based on stem cell research that is shown to be effective, shown to be uh, efficient, and um, it's not a dead end and has possible applications, he might not be opposed to it because it, goes, it covers his reasoning, right? It directly ties in with his reasoning and shows that his reasoning may be flawed and it may change his mind. Whereas Bob would still not care that if it's effective, he doesn't like it for ethical reasons, right? So you wanna look at not only what is the author saying, but why are they saying it? 